morning. Praise the Lord. Always so happy to see young people making those decisions for Jesus and for eternity. And uh, I know there's some others that are on the verge of that that are studying now, and we just continue to pray for our young people. Have the next generation commit their lives to the Lord. You know, as I was praying about what to share this week, um, the Lord impressed me to talk about something that uh, is very basic and foundational, but I think it's good for us to be reminded of these things. Now, there's few things that are more important than the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, there is one Jesus, one Bible, one Holy Spirit, but unfortunately there are hundreds of different Christian denominations. And the different denominations argue about different theological points. Um, I'm sure there's some that would disagree with us, but a lot of them disagree with each other over everything from the, you know, mode of baptism, whether or not you need to speak in tongues if you receive the Holy Spirit, uh, whether or not the wine during the communion should be uh, fermented or unfermented, uh, whether or not you should do it every week or once a year. There's just a whole plethora of different doctrines that churches debate and argue about. And some things are more important than others. Even within our church, you'll find some difference of opinion on who comprises the 144,000 and understanding the seven trumpets and Daniel 11. And, and you know, there are some things that maybe are not essentials, but if there is anything that is an essential to understand, I would think it would be, oh, what do God's commandments say? What is sin? Uh, these things are, are priorities. They're very important issues. And so this morning, I thought I'd just remind you of something that uh, is an obvious departure from what I see as biblical truth. If Jesus should come to the Sacramento area this morning and walk up and down the streets of the city and see the different churches that have the word Christian on them, he would find 90%, maybe 95% of the doors closed on Sabbath. And I suppose that would grieve him because the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. So our message today is Sunday really sacred? And we're going to begin at the beginning. Some of you know the story of the Trojan horse. The Trojan horse is a story, and some of it we believe is based on truth. There may be some myth mixed in there, but according to the story, uh, the city of Troy was being besieged by the Greeks. The city of Troy was somewhere in the Dardanelles Straits there in Turkey. And for 10 years, the Greeks tried to overthrow Troy, but they could not get through their big walls and they were able to withstand a siege. So someone came up with a clever plan and they made a gigantic horse from some of the wrecked ships that were on the shore. A big wooden horse. They put it on large wheels and they said it was an offering to the god Athena. They were retreating from the battle. And during the night, they pushed the horse up to the gates of Troy uh, as a, an offering to Athena that for, to forgive them that they were not able to conquer the city of Troy. And they pretended to withdraw. The ships sailed away. They actually just sailed around out of view. And one man was left with a horse that was tied up. He was supposedly a prisoner. He was actually one of the Greeks. And he said, yeah, they, they made this great horse as an offering to Athena to get her favor. They knew it would be too big for you to get inside your city and that's why they made it so big. Well, they said, oh, too big to get inside. So we got gates big enough to get this horse inside. Well, what they didn't know is that the Greeks had put a small force of elite soldiers, half a dozen soldiers, inside the horse. And they said, we want the blessing of Athena on our city. And so they thought, maybe if we get their uh, blessing of their gods inside our city, that we'll be safe in the future. And so they brought the Trojan horse inside the city and uh, closed the gates. Well, that night, the Greeks came back and there was a signal given by the one supposed slave who had come along with the horse. He shone a, a light. The soldiers were released from the horse, they went and they opened the gates of the city in time for the Greeks to come in and Troy fell because of the Trojan horse. Now the moral of the story is sometimes we bring in something from the enemy and we think that it, it's going to be a blessing that really contains a curse. It's like you're receiving a virus 
uh, into your church or into your city or your nation by adopting something from the enemy. And uh, that'll make more sense as we go along. Starting at the beginning, Genesis chapter 2, God made the world in six days, no really seven days because he wasn't done creating until after the full week. He made one more thing. He made a day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested the seventh day from all his work which he had done and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, made it holy because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. He did not make it holy for himself. He made it holy for man to remember. The Bible says the Sabbath was made for man. It doesn't say the Sabbath was made for Jews. The word there is anthropos. It means mankind, humanity. And it's the first time also you're going to find the word seven mentioned three times. It says seven, seven, seven. It's a number associated with God. The seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. Very specific. You get to the last book of the Bible. It's got another number associated with man who was made on the sixth day and it's 666. So you got this contest between the worship of God and the worship of man that goes on through the Bible. Now you go to the Ten Commandments. You find them in Exodus chapter 20 verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you should labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. Your son or your daughter, so forth. But it very clearly says, do all your work, six days, seventh day, holy time. This is one of the Ten Commandments spoken by God's voice. They are not ten suggestions. They're not ten recommendations. God spoke with his own voice, wrote with his own finger, his eternal law, moral law for all his people, for all the world for that matter. So which day is the seventh day? Some people say, well, you can't really know. Just using the Bible, uh, well, if we start with the dictionary. That's not the Bible. Dictionary, seventh day, Saturday, seventh day of the week. You go to the Bible tells us that Jesus was crucified on the preparation day which we know to be Friday. Uh, then it says they went home and they kept the Sabbath according to the commandment, the seventh day. And then he rose, they came to the tomb early Sunday morning, the first day. People call it Easter Sunday. So you can even look in the Bible, it's pretty clear. In a hundred and, it's not this way in English. In English we call the seventh day Saturday. But in a lot of other languages, Spanish, how do you say Saturday? Sabado. Portuguese? Sabado. Russian? Subota. I got some Russians here. And 105 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week, what we call Saturday, is Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? So why is everyone going to church on Sunday? Is Sunday sacred? Where did that happen? Some say, well, the calendar was changed. Well, there have been a couple of changes to the calendar. Here's an example of one. When we went from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar in 1582, you'll notice what happened. They added 10 days to compensate for the seasons. They also put in leap years so they'd keep things on track. And you went to October 1, 2, 3, 4, 15. So did it change the calendar? Yes. Did it change the weekly cycle? Not at all. It went from Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sabbath, Saturday. The weekly cycle has never been changed by the calendar. Someone wrote a letter to the uh, U.S. Naval Observatory and they said, have there been any changes in the calendar through history that have affected the weekly cycle? They wrote back and they said, they don't know of any record of any change to the calendar that has ever affected the continuity of the weekly cycle. And so when people say, ah, well, the challenge, we don't know what day Saturday and Sunday really are anymore because the calendar has been changed. I think it's always interesting that uh, they never have a problem with the calendar until they learn the Sabbath truth. Then they say the calendar was changed. We don't know. And if you don't believe that, then you've got the evidence of 15 million, 16 million Jews around the world. Uh, and I could see that some of them might be shipwrecked on a deserted island and they lose track of the time and say, you know, we don't remember what day is Saturday anymore, but for the whole nation to forget is very unlikely. So with that in mind, what day is the Lord's Day? Now many Christians will say, well you've got the Sabbath day which is what the Jews kept and then you've got the Lord's Day which is what Christians teach. And they get this from Revelation chapter 1, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 
where John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice behind me like the sound of a trumpet. And so this is uh, the beginning of Revelation. And they say, see, that's the Lord's day. But there's not a single verse in the Bible that says that that is referring to the Lord's day. In fact, it's the contrary. John was imprisoned by Rome on the Isle of Patmos where they had mines and the prisoners were required to work in the mines but John refused to work on the Sabbath day and that is when the Lord gave him the vision. It doesn't say anything in the text that this is now some new different day of worship for the children of Israel or for the Christians. What does the Bible say is the Lord's day? Isaiah 58, 13, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. What day is the Lord's day? Sabbath day. Look at this one. Exodus 6, we just read the Ten Commandments. Six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews. Is that what it says? No. Sabbath day is, is the Sabbath of the Lord. And Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. All things that were made were made by Christ. Will that include when he wrote the Ten Commandments? Yes. So if the Sabbath is the Lord's day, why do so many people worship on Sunday? You know, this was in our uh, scripture reading. Jesus said, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Sunday keeping is not based on scripture, it is based on a tradition. Now, I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible as we go on here and from history. Uh, some of you have heard this interesting story from history where I think it was Zorn Nicholas, he looked out of his palace walls one day and he noticed that this guard had always been standing at this obscure place on the wall. There's no gate, there was no door, and one day he was walking in the garden, he went up to the guard and he said, why exactly are you standing here? Well, the guard was very nervous. And he said, well, I have orders to stand here, your majesty. And he said, do you know why? He said, no, we've just always had someone here 24 hours a day. So he went to the captain. Now the Tsar was getting very curious. And he said, why do we always have a soldier standing at that particular remote spot in the garden? There's nothing there. And he said, well, we've, it's just been a standing order for years. We've always had 24 hours a day. A guard is to be stationed there. It's been mandated. It's in the archives. So the Tsar went to look at the archives to try and find out why is there a soldier there. And the archives had said, a hundred years earlier, Catherine the Great was entertaining guests. One of her guests came, a dignitary from another country, and gave her a gift of an exotic rose bush. They planted the rose bush and she said, I don't want this to be trampled. Have a guard guard my rose bush. Well, the rose bush died five years after they planted it. But at that point, they were in the habit of guarding that spot. And so for a hundred years, a guard was standing there without questioning why he was standing there. It was a tradition. And there are still traditions that Christians guard that there is no rhyme or reason for except that it's a tradition. There's no biblical reason for it. So some of the other um, scriptures that explain this, Ezekiel 22 verse 26 and verse 31, her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They put no difference between the profane and the holy. They have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them. You know, one of the reasons I was convinced of the Sabbath truth is because after I first learned these things, I went to my pastors. I used to go to church on Sunday. I was so into Christianity, I was going to several different churches. One church said we'd have a Wednesday night Bible study, I'd be there. Then i go to another denomination, I'd be at their service. Another one would have a special early morning service, I went there. I was going to four or five different churches, studying with all these Christian groups in Southern California. I was just hungry, I couldn't get enough. But when I learned the Sabbath truth, I'd ask the different pastors, I'd say, so why do we go to church on Sunday? And if you ask 10 different pastors, you would get 11 different answers. One would say, these are just a few examples. Doug, we're no longer under the Ten Commandments. Uh, we're now under grace. I said, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that we don't need to keep the Ten Commandments? They said, well, we're not under the law. I said, well, wait, let me, help me understand that. Is it okay now to kill? Well, no. Steal? No. Lie? No. Commit adultery? No. What they really meant is, there's one commandment you're not supposed to remember anymore. That's the Sabbath. I said, but isn't that the one that says remember? 
So that didn't make sense. And so I, I talked to another one. He said, um, because of the resurrection, Jesus rose on the first day of the week, and so it is the new Christian Sabbath. I said, that sounds beautiful. I said, where is the scripture that tells us that? Well, there is no specific scripture, but we've got a long-standing tradition as though there's some value in that. And then I, I had another friend. He was the most creative. And he said, Doug, back in the days of Joshua, you remember Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. Saturday turned into Sunday back then. <laughs> and I said, well, that's interesting. I said, except why did they continue to keep it on the seventh day for another 1,500 years after that? And he couldn't answer that. And they were all giving me difference. They didn't agree with each other. I said, something's wrong. They're, they are hiding their eyes from a very obvious truth because they have counted the cost of what will, what will it mean if I take a stand for this biblical truth? I'll lose my congregation. I'll be very unpopular. I know pastors that have taken a stand and it cost them. I know some pastors took a stand for the truth and the majority of the church followed them in the Sabbath truth. And so it's always better. So what we're going to do now, um, if we want to know why, why would it, any Christian keep Sunday instead of the Sabbath, the first day instead of the seventh, um, we're going to look at every reference to Sunday, except you realize the word Sunday does not appear in the New Testament. Sometimes you'll hear the word sundry, if you're reading the King James, sundry is not Sunday. Sundry means different. God in various times and sundry manners spoke to the prophets in time past. That means different manners. Um, so if you look at every reference to the first day of the week, which is what we commonly refer to as Sunday, you might find if there's a change. There's eight references in the New Testament. Now nobody's going to argue the Old Testament because it's very clear it's the seventh day there. So we're going to take them one by one. Does that sound fair? And we'll look at them and see what the Bible says. Look at the first four references are simply historical. They are talking about the time of the resurrection. Matthew 28 verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, uh, my friend Harold Camping, uh, I say that a little bit sarcastically, I apologize. Uh, Harold Camping was the founder of Family Radio, a good radio station. I listened to them, but uh, he used to answer Bible questions and he would always, when people asked about the Sabbath, he would go to this verse. He say, see what it says right there? The end of the Sabbath. That means the Sabbath is now over. You don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. I said, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that that week after the crucifixion, after the Sabbath was over, it's saying that they came early in the morning on the first day of the week. You tried to build a whole doctrine. I told you there's 11 different answers if you ask 10 different pastors the reason why. As it began towards the first day of the week. Now, is that a new command to keep the first day? No. Do you find built into that anything that says now we have a new Sabbath day? It's on the first day. No, it's a simple historical record. Now, did, was it important that Jesus rose on the first day of the week? Absolutely. Does that make it a new Sabbath? Was there anything wrong with the seventh day where God had to now change it? No. Was the seventh day Sabbath chosen before or after sin? Before sin. It's part of God's perfect plan. There's nothing wrong with it. Did God do important things on Thursday? Was the Lord's Supper important? That's Thursday. Does it make it a new Sabbath? How important is the crucifixion? What day of the week was that? Friday. Is that a new Sabbath? Not for us, it is for the Muslims. So the Lord does different things, but He didn't command us to keep any other day than the first day. That would be like saying, I made a mistake with the seventh day, um, now it's the first. Mark 16, 9, a very similar reference. Now when Jesus was risen on the first day of the week, He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Do you find built into this verse that it's, there's a new commandment? No. no, there's nothing there. It's simply the record of what happened. John 20, very similar. The first day of the week comes Mary early while it was still dark. She came to the tomb. And just again, a historical record, there's no new voice from a mountain, no new finger writing new law in stone saying now the first day is to be our new Sabbath. Nothing of the sort. Mark 16, 1 and 2. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Now this to me is actually proof that the seventh day was still important. 
If Jesus had taught the apostles that they didn't need to keep the Sabbath anymore, or the seventh day wasn't going to be important, it was not going to be meaningful for them, why was it so important to the disciples that they would not finish embalming his body on Friday when the sun was going down? They knew Jesus would not be pleased with that. There was a lot of work involved in it. And they said, let's wait until after the Sabbath has passed. That's why they waited, because the Sabbath was important. You know, Jesus even kept the Sabbath in his death. He died Friday, rested through the Sabbath, rose after it was over. And so the idea that it's been done away with just doesn't hold water. Uh, no new commandment here. Okay, oops, I got, I got two. Got to back up one, all right. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Again, it's just telling us what happened there. And then the next reference is in Luke. Luke 23, verse 56 says they returned and they prepared spices and fragrant oils. They rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandments. So they prepared. That was the preparation day. They got everything ready. That's what we would call Friday. They, uh, they kept the Sabbath according, does he say the Jewish law? Luke was a Gentile. He says the, the Sabbath. He states it like every Christian will know about this. And he's writing this years after the crucifixion. He could have said the old Jewish Sabbath. He says according to the commandment, not the old commandment. It's all stated as though it's still in existence. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, the tomb. Is there anything in here that says, and God established a new Sabbath day? So we're looking at all the references to the first day. We're looking for that commandment. I know one evangelist was very dramatic when he would preach on this subject. He would, you know, bring a thousand dollars and he'd put it up, uh, up front for everyone to see it. And he said, I'm going to give this away to anybody tonight that can show me this missing text in the Bible. What I want from you is to show me one commandment in the Bible to keep the first day as the new Christian Sabbath. Of course, everybody's very quiet because it's not there. And he always got to take his money home. So he was happy doing that. Now we'll go to the sixth reference text uh, referring to the first day of the week. And it talks, is it a new Sabbath day? This is talking about the day of the resurrection. It says, then that same day at evening. Oh wait, what day is this? First day. When does a day begin and end in the Bible? So when it's talking about the same day that Christ rose, first day of the week, evening, it's getting ready to turn into Monday. See what's happening? When the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled, for to, to inaugurate a new Sabbath, is that why they're assembled? It says they're assembled for fear of the Jews. The Jews were saying the body was stolen, they thought they were going to come looking for them, and Jesus came, met with them, said peace to you. Now, you also look later, I think it's verse 26 in the same chapter, it says eight days later he met with them again, this time Thomas is there. What is eight days after Sunday? Seven days after Sunday would be what? Sunday. Eight days after Sunday is Monday. So he also meets with them on a Monday. Is that a new Sabbath? So the idea, because Jesus did something and met with the disciples, he met with them by the sea when they were fishing. It, obviously if they were fishing it wasn't a Sabbath. But he met with them then too. He met with them over a period of 40 days after the resurrection. Does this seventh passage say that Sunday is holy? And that passage is 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. We've only got one more after this. Now this is one some people use. They say this is proof that the disciples were now keeping Sunday as a new Christian Sabbath. Paul says, on the first day of the week, in the way it actually reads in the original, on the beginning of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Paul is on his way through Asia. He's on his way to Jerusalem to take a special offering from the churches in Jerusalem. He's making haste. There's a famine. They're hungry. And he said, look, at the beginning of the week, they used to get their accounts in order in the first of the week. Everybody sets something aside when you've done your bookkeeping. So there is no church offering when I come. It's actually saying the very opposite. This is not talking about passing the plate Sunday morning. He's saying, the beginning of the week, lay something aside, 
so that we don't have a collection when I come. It's ready to give to me, and I'm making haste, and I'm on my way. Is this, is this the new Sabbath commandment? Does he say anything here about now do not work on that day? Uh, make sure that we gather together for worship on that day. It has, it's just a practical um, recommendation that they set aside an offering for collection purposes. All right, does the eighth, there's question seven, this is the eighth now in the final reference to the first day of the week that you're going to find in the Bi Bible, and people work real hard to make hay out of this one. Um, is it saying that Sunday is a new holy day? Let's look at it together. It's Acts 20 verse 7. If you've got your Bibles, I recommend you turn there. Acts 20 verse 7. Luke is telling a remarkable story. And we'll find out why he's telling the story. Now on the first day of the week, yes, that would be Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread. Ah, ah, there you got it. They came together to break bread. They're having a communion service. They're gathering on the first day and they're having a communion service. This must be evidence that they now are worshiping on the first day. It is the new Sabbath. Uh, I respectfully disagree. I don't think that's what they're saying at all. It says, Paul is ready to depart the next day. He speaks to them and he continues his message till midnight. Now, when does the first day begin? Sundown. So when it says that they're meeting on the first day of the week and it's an evening meeting, what this is is a Saturday night meeting. And why is he talking so long? Because he's, not, he's beginning a journey the next day. If Sunday is a new Sabbath, why is he beginning a journey? Let's keep reading. First of all, the scholar Horatio Hackett said, the Jews reckon the day from evening to morning that on that principle, the evening of the first day of the week would have been our Saturday night. By the way, this uh, scholar is not a member of our church. He's just being honest. The apostle held his last religious service on Saturday evening and consequently resumed his journey on Sunday morning. Commentary on the book of Acts. So Acts 20 it says, a young man named Eutychus was sitting in the window who's sinking into a deep sleep he falls down from the third story and he's taken up dead because Paul was long in preaching which is a good recommendation for pastors not to preach too long because it can be lethal when that happens. So Paul goes down, he embraces the young man, he says his life is still in him, Eutychus is resurrected, Luke is telling this story because he's saying a resurrection took place. Notice what happened when they came up after Eutychus is resurrected they broke bread, now they're breaking bread again. They eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak. They stayed up all night long. They ate bread twice. And then Paul depart. The next day, oh, by the way, breaking bread in Acts 20, 46, so you only break bread on, uh, the, what does breaking bread mean? Is it always a communion service? So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, daily in the temple, daily breaking bread from a house to house. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Breaking bread did not always mean a communion service. It meant eating. You remember on the road to Emmaus, he went in and broke bread with them. They were eating. And that was a Sunday night, which would have been Monday. So it's not saying anywhere in these verses that Sunday is now a new Sabbath. They ate their bread with gladness, simplicity of heart. The next day Paul said goodbye to them. He began a journey. That would have been Sunday. Would that be when you begin a long epic journey? No. The prior day Sabbath he spent with them all day and that evening he preached. Luke, uh, Eutychus fell out the window. He's resurrected. That's why Luke is telling the story. He's not telling the story to say a new Sabbath was inaugurated in Acts chapter 20. Wouldn't God have told us if one of the Ten Commandments had been changed? Yes. What do you think? Yes. How many of you heard that they've changed the law now, Highway 65, you can go 80 miles an hour? Isn't that exciting? Did, did you hear that? <laughs> How many of you believe me? Nobody believes a pastor. <laughs> Why don't you believe me? Because you know that if the state is going to change a major law that would affect everybody's lives, they are responsible to thoroughly announce that and advertise it to avoid accidents, right? Everyone's going to know about that. Now when God gave the Sabbath commandment, He spoke with His, I wish they would go 80 miles an hour and 65 because it is sure slow after church when you get out there by Pleasant Grove. But 
after um, God gave the Sabbath, he speaks it with his voice, he writes it with his finger in front of an entire nation. If he's going to change that, don't you think there'd be something in the New Testament? That there, there'd be some, com some battle? Look at all the argument that the Jews had with the Christians over circumcision. You find that discussed all through the writings of Paul. There was a great debate over that. They had a great debate about whether or not you could eat food sacrificed to idols or not. But you realize there's never a debate about whether or not you should keep the Sabbath. Jesus spoke a lot about the Sabbath, but he never spoke about whether or not it should be kept. He spoke about how it should be kept. It was always presumed it would be kept because it's one of the Ten Commandments. God's not going to change one of the Ten Commandments without making that very clear. Paul said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now Paul is giving the whole counsel of God. Why did Paul never say anywhere, by the way, the new Christian Sabbath is the first day of the week. None of them say that. And yet what does most of the world do? Could the disciples have changed the Sabbath even if they wanted to? Does even a disciple have the authority to do that? No. Paul said, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Revelation 22 verse 19, if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take away his part from the book of life. We cannot change the word of God. Some people think, oh this Sabbath thing, you're making a big deal out of a little thing. Friends, I disagree. I think this is the biggest kind of thing that Christians ought to stand for. It is one of the commandments of God. Someday we'll all be judged by the commandments. It says, so do and so speak that those will be judged by the law of liberty. That's what James tells us. Uh, Jesus said, heaven and earth, Matthew 5, 18, will pass away before one jot or tittle passes from the law. And then Christ said, whoever will think to break one of the least of these commandments and do so, he'll be spoken of as least in the kingdom of heaven. These are very important issues to God. Uh, my, uh, how do Christians remember Jesus' death? Is it a new Sabbath day? Or did Christ give us something? The Bible tells us that Romans chapter 6 verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Has Christ given us something to remember his resurrection? Yes. Is it a new Sabbath? No. What is it? Baptism. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should walk in a newness of life. The death, burial, resurrection of the Lord is not replaced by a new uh, Sabbath day. It is memorialized by baptism. is a reminder of the resurrection. Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Isn't that clear? Say amen. amen. You're, I think you're very quiet today. <laughs> so how does the Bible refer to the first day of the week? Is it a new Sabbath? Ezekiel 46.1, thus says the Lord God, the gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut during the six working days, but the Sabbath it will be opened. The first day of the week is called a what? It's a regular working day. Now you may be in a country where you can actually uh, be prosecuted for breaking what they call blue laws. There are some countries where uh, I know a lady, her father was put in jail in Canada because he was out working in his field on Sunday. Uh, there were times where you weren't allowed to work on Sunday. The laws of men. So if Sunday keeping isn't in the Bible, and I think I tried to establish that, where did it come from? Well, it comes from, just as the name implies, sun worship. Uh, for years in Rome, and they get it from the Babylonians and it goes all the way back to Egypt. One of their principal gods was Ra, the god of the sun. And around the ancient world they understood something miraculous happened with photosynthesis. When the days get longer and when the sun shines, plants come out, life comes out, the other animals and herbivores do better and all of a sudden everything springs into life by virtue of sun. They understood there's a mystery there. Photosynthesis is an amazing thing. We even get electricity from sunlight now, don't we? solar panels, right? 
So they, they knew there was power in the sun, but instead of worshiping the one that made the sun, they started worshiping the sun. And Moses said, do not lift up your eyes and worship the sun, the moon, and the stars like the heathen do. By the time of Christ in Rome, their sun worship was one of their principal gods, and um, what was gradually happening is as the church grew, eventually, by the time of Paul, there were soon more Gentiles believing in Christ than there were Jews. And pretty soon there were a lot more Gentiles in the church than Jews, and the Gentiles, wanting to reach their pagan friends, they said, let's make as many accommodations as we can to try to reach them. And so for a while, in Rome, they actually, they worshiped the day of the sun on the first day of the week, and um, many Christians, they worshiped on the Sabbath. They said, you know, we'll get a lot more of them to join our church if we will also recognize Sunday. They thought they were being evangelistic. And it came in like a Trojan horse. The Jews were very unpopular. You realize that uh, 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem for the rebellion. And uh, it was a very expensive war. You know, the Romans had to fight three years against Masada. And it was a very expensive war. The, the Romans were so tired of the Jews that when they finally conquered Jerusalem, they decimated the people. It was a terrible siege. The Christians, wanting to distance themselves from the Jews who had become very unpopular, and they thought they were legalistic, they said, well, we, we actually, we worship on the Lord's Day. And because Jesus rose on the first day of the week, and they started to manufacture theology that had no Bible basis at all. Let me go on and prove this to you. Matthew 15, verse 9, And in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines of the commandments of men. Now, I've got to say something right here. Are there going to be a lot of people in heaven that went to church on Sunday? Yes. Millions. Millions and millions of Sunday-keeping Christians are going to be there because they did not know. Are there going to be people in heaven that own slaves? You don't want to say yes, but you know it's true. Otherwise, you just kicked Abraham out of heaven. <laughs> right? And David. And Jacob. Are there going to be people in heaven that had multiple wives at one time? Yes. God winks at the times of ignorance, but when we know the truth, we need to walk in the truth. So yes, there's, gonna, there's good, I believe there are spirit-filled, godly, Christian, heaven-bound people in many Sunday churches that maybe don't understand these things. Sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. The Bible says, if we continue in sin after we receive a knowledge of the truth, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, there is no more sacrifice. And so it, when we understand and then we say, I'm going to do what tradition says instead of what the Word of God says, that's serious then. The earliest recognition of the observance of Sunday, it's a constitution of Constantine in 321 AD, enacting that all the courts of justice and inhabitants and towns and the workshops were to rest on Sunday. Here's the decree of Constantine. On the venerable day of the sun, is that S-O-N like son of God? Or is it S-U-N, like sun in the sky? It's the sun. See, Constantine knew the Romans still were involved in sun worship. First day of the week, that's where it gets its name. You know where Monday gets its name? Munde, in Spanish. Lunes, right? Which is, l that's where you get lunatic. It's true. The people thought with full moon, people went crazy. And um, the different days of the week were named after the different Greco-Roman gods and somewhere a Viking god got in there Thursday was Thor's day but uh, Wednesday was Odin's day Friday was Frida, Saturday, Saturn and so they were named after the different heavenly gods and the pagan gods so he says on the venerable day of the sun let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest let all the workshops be closed it was to be a Sabbath they did get permission for the farmers to milk their goats and do their farm work on Sunday. The church made a sacred day of Sunday largely because it was the weekly festival of the sun for it was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals endeared to the people by tradition and to give them a Christian significance. Arthur Wiggle, Paganism in our Christianity. The author of this is not a member of my church. He's just writing history. Another example of that, they started to allow idolatry because they said, look, the pagans all love their idols. They got their idols of Venus and of, uh, uh, um, uh, what, what is it called? Athena, um, Mercury, Apollos, Jupiter, 
And uh, so they just said, Mary, Peter, James, John, and they, they gave them all Christian names. They said, well, we'll, it'll make it easier for them to transition. We want to make it easy. So they compromised to try and make it easy for them to join the church. And they started to, pretty soon they gave up the Bible Sabbath. And the church leaders say, we will feast on Sunday. Made it very attractive to the pagans to come in, but we will fast on the Sabbath. Now, after a while of fasting on the seventh day, feasting on the first day, which day would you enjoy? You can see that over time the Sabbath became very unpopular because first of all they said it was the, it's the Jewish Sabbath and, and then they started to uh, say, oh, we feast on Sunday and gradually it was abandoned. By the fifth century, Sozomen stated that most churches such as Constantinople met both on Sabbath, the first day, and Saturday evening, uh, but that in Rome and Alexandria met only on the first day, Saturday evening, and no longer on the Sabbath. So you start tracking the history and the, the church fathers say that there was a gradual transition had nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus or the apostles. It is a man-made tradition that God's people have drifted from the commandments of God. But in the last days we should be returning. Now here are some quotes just from church history. This is the Catholic Encyclopedia Volume 4. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or the seventh day of the week to the first made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Now, I took this picture. This is a picture, a granite copy of the Ten Commandments in front of a Catholic church here in Sacramento. If you look real close, you'll see a picture of me in my t-shirt taking a picture reflected. This is, and I zoomed in a little bit. I want you to notice something here. They don't have the second commandment. The second commandment they make, don't take the name of the Lord your vain. That's supposed to be the third commandment. They delete the commandment about idolatry. It's totally not there. They take the fourth commandment and they make it the third commandment. And then in order to keep ten commandments, they then take the tenth commandment and they divide it. They, instead of thou shalt not covet, they say don't covet your neighbor's wife and don't covet your neighbor's house and they should make a 13 commandments, don't cover your neighbor's donkey too, they should have made a third one out of that, but they tried to maintain the number 10, it says the beast power would think to change times and laws, and they certainly did that. What do Sunday churches say about this problem? Now friends, stay with me, I'm going to do some reading here. I, I'm going to just read quotes from other churches, scholars, official statements, so you know, they know that something is wrong. Baptist from the Baptist manual, there is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. That's pretty clear, amen? No scriptural evidence. Another Baptist commentary, this is called The Lord's Day in Our Day by William uh, Owen Carver. There was never any formal or authoritative change from the Jewish seventh day Sabbath to the Christian first day observance. It's not there. Uh, Alexander Campbell, one of the leaders in the Church of Christ, I do not believe the Lord's Day was changed from the seventh day to the first day. Catholic. This is from the book Cardinal James Gibbons, Faith of Our Fathers. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You'll not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The Catholic Church for over a thousand years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her own divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. They freely admit that they were there. The holy, uh, the holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, the day of the Lord, not based on scriptural authority, but from the church's sense of its own power. Catch the rest of this. People who think the scriptures should be their sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Amen. Well, they admit it. I appreciate that. Catholic Services Appeal 1995 from uh, Catholic, St. Catherine Catholic Church, St. Clair Boulevard. Uh, you got one from the Anglican Church. And where are we told in the scriptures that we're to keep the first day at all? We're commanded to keep the seventh day. But we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day. The reason why we keep the first day of the week holy instead of the seventh is because the church has enjoined it. I say it's something that church fathers did. But they have no right to change the law of God. Is, did God say, I'll bless whatever day you pick? Or did he say, you keep my day? And he told us what his day is. It's the Sabbath of the Lord. Is there any command, Episcopal writes, is there any command in the New Testament to change the day of the week of rest from Saturday to Sunday? None. 
That's their manual of Christian doctrine. Methodist. Harris Franklin Rawl, he was a Methodist theologian, take the matter of Sunday. There is no passage telling Christians to keep the day. So, what is Apostle Paul saying in Romans 14? I hear people, whenever they learn the Sabbath truth, they say, well, wait a second now. We don't really need to keep any day. And they go right to two verses. Romans 14, Colossians 2. We're going to look at them real quick because we're not afraid of any of these verses. Romans 14, verse 5 and 6, Paul says, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own, ma in his own uh, mind. So you want to keep Sunday? You keep Sunday. I'll keep Saturday. You know, I've never heard a Sunday pastor stand up and tell his congregation, you keep whatever day you want to keep. They don't ever say, you want to go Sabbath? It's fine. Uh, they, well, there might be some. But uh, there are actually some Sunday churches having services on two days a week now. Because more of them are learning that. More of their members are asking questions because they're watching Amazing Facts programs. <laughs> I know one pastor that told me, you're causing me a lot of problems. <laughs> but um, this is simply saying, they're talking about the Jewish ceremonial laws, that if you want to keep Passover, the, the Jews that were very scrupulous about keeping the annual feast, he said, look, if you want to keep that day, keep it to the Lord, but don't make other people keep it. I tell Christians that. Some people say, are we supposed to celebrate Christmas? I said, look, if you want to remember the gift of God, giving the Son, that's up to you. Don't tell someone else they have to. There's no scripture command about it. If you're going to do it, don't do it for elves and Santa Claus. Do it for Jesus coming into the world. So there's, you know, it's up to you what you want to do. That's how I would use that. Would God ever say concerning the Sabbath, I realized I had a man stoned to death for breaking the Sabbath in the Old Testament, but if you want to keep it, it's up to you. Is that the same God? No. It's one of God's commandments. Sin is the transgression of the law. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. So what is meant in Colossians 2, verse 14 through 16? Now we're going to look at that real quick. Let me read it to you. Notice now, you can look it up in your Bible. I want you to follow these words carefully because someone's going to ask you about this. Having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances. Notice it's handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Notice the word against us. Which was contrary to us and he took it out of the way having nailed it to the cross having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now what is he talking about when he says having abolished the handwriting and the ordinances? Look in 2 Chronicles 33 verse 8. That you take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. You got two laws, friends. You got the Ten Commandments and the ordinances given by Moses. Ten Commandments, hand of God, ordinances, handwriting of Moses. Notice that distinction. Paul in Colossians is talking about the ordinances. Deuteronomy 4.13 So he declared to you his covenant that he commanded you to perform even the Ten Commandments, that's clear, right? And he wrote them on two tables of stone and in addition to that the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them. Those are the ordinances in the land that you cross over to possess. They're written by a man's hand on paper. 2 Kings 21.8 Only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. You got the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses. Two separate distinct laws. God kept them separate. You got the Ark of the Covenant. What's inside the Ark? Ten Commandments. But what about the ordinances? Take this book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark, it was a pocket on the outside of the Covenant, of the Lord your God, that it might be there as a witness against thee. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. So what's nailed to the cross? The Ten Commandments? Or the ceremonial Sabbaths? that you find in the Bible. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, notice. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, small less, plural. Sabbaths, now he tells you what kind of Sabbaths. Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. There were certain Sabbaths that came after sin. They were annual feasts. 
that were shadows foretelling the coming of Christ, they were nailed to the cross. The handwriting of Moses. Not the Sabbath that was part of creation. The Bible says in heaven we're going to keep that one. From one Sabbath to another all flesh will come and worship before the Lord. It's the annual Sabbath that Paul is talking about. And you know I just went through for my own edification last night I looked up these verses. I went through all of the Protestant scholars. Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, John Gill, um, Jameis' Foss and Brown Spurgeon, you can look at them all. They all understand the Sabbaths that were nailed to the cross were ceremonial Sabbaths. It's only recently that theologians are saying that one of the commandments was nailed to the cross. None of the Protestant Puritan fathers believe that. And so um, it's just a heresy that's come in. Does Revelation say God's people will be keeping His commandments in the last days? Why am I preaching this? Because before Jesus comes there's got to be a revival. Three angels message is calling people to return to the Creator, right? Worship Him who made. That means if you're going to remember the Creator, remember the day He set aside for that. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Blessed are they that do His commandments that they might have a right to the tree of God and they may enter in through the gates of the city. And again, it says Hebrews 5, 9, and being made perfect he became the eternal author, the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. You know all over North America there's train tracks. We have train tracks. You ever heard the train go by while we're doing the service? Right here? Train tracks right out there. You know how wide they are? They are four feet eight and a half inches. All across North America they've got to have train tracks the same size or the trains don't fit the tracks. Do you know why they're four feet eight and a half inches? Because when we made our trains in America they used the same jigs and machinery they use for the wagons. So why are the wagons in America, why were they axle length four feet eight and one half inches? Because when the people came over from England that was the size of their wagons. They used the same machinery, the same measurements that were on their wagons. Some of them were shipped over and so they all made them the same length. Why were all of the wagons in England that length? Because all of the wagons in Europe were that length. Why were all of the wagons in Europe four feet eight and a half inches? Because they found if they did not make them four feet eight and a half inches long the wheels did not fit in the stone ruts on the main roads in Europe and it would break them off because they were always fighting the ruts in the road and it broke off the wheels. So they had to make them four feet eight and a half inches. It's really a bad length for a train. You would like to have wider wheels on a train. They wouldn't tip over near as often. Going around a turn too fast didn't we just lose a train? You heard about it in uh, England, or no in uh, Washington. Why were the ruts that size? Because the Romans built the roads and the Roman chariots were four feet eight and one half inches, the chariot wheels. Do you know why the Roman chariot wheels were that wide? <laughs> because that's how wide they needed to be to accommodate the rear end of two chariot horses. So the trains all over North America have been governed by the rear end <laughs> of two horses. It's interesting how you get stuck on something that's hard to change. But if you should try to change them, now you realize you go to China and Japan, they're bullet trains, you know why they're ahead of us on bullet trains? Because they don't follow the Roman chariot size. <laughs> and they were able to get to it faster than us. So God wants us to continue obeying. Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will. So it's one thing to say, oh I know that, that's very interesting Pastor Doug, but are you going to be a hearer of the word or a doer of the word? What is the will of God? I delight to do your will, O oh my God, your law is within my heart. When the law of God, love for your neighbor, first four commandments is love for God, last six commandments are love for your fellow man, the law is summed up in love, and uh, if we love him, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? He said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. He doesn't want us to just be hearers of the word. He invites us, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. And he wants you to have that rest. I want to read something to you. I thought that was very interesting in conclusion here. Take my yoke upon me. You will find rest for your souls. Sabbath is all about enjoying that rest. Have you ever heard the poem of the crooked calf path? One day through a primal wood, a calf walked home as good calves should, but made a trail all bent askew, a crooked trail as all calves do. Since then three hundred years have fled, and I assume the calf is dead, but still he left behind his trail, and herein lies my zany tale. The trail was taken the very next day by a lone dog that passed that way, and then a wise bellwether sheep pursued the trail over vale and steep, and drew the flock behind him too, as good bellwethers always do. And from that day o'er hill and glade, through those old woods, a path was made, and many men wound in and out, and dodged and turned and bent about, and uttered words of righteous wrath, because it was such a crooked path. But still they followed, do not laugh, the first migrations of the calf. And through this winding wood they stalked, because he wobbled when he walked. The forest path became a lane that bent and turned and turned again. This crooked lane became a road where many a poor horse with his load toiled on beneath the burning sun and traveled three miles in one. And thus a century and a half they trod the footsteps of that calf. The years passed on in swiftness, swiftness fleet. The road then became a village street. And this before men were aware, it became a city's crowded thoroughfare. And soon the central street was this of renowned metropolis. And men two centuries and a half trod in the footsteps of the calf. Each day a hundred thousand rout followed that zigzag calf about, or this crooked journey went the traffic of a continent. A hundred thousand men were led by one calf near three centuries dead. They followed still his crooked way and lose one hundred years a day. For thus such reverence is lent to well-established precedent. A moral lesson here this might teach why I ordained or called to preach. For men are prone to go at blind along the calf paths of the mind and work away from sun to sun to do what other men have done. They follow on the beaten track and out and in and forth and back and still their devious course pursue to keep the path that others do. They keep the path a sacred groove along which all their lives they move and how the wise old wood gods laugh who saw the first primeval calf. You get that? Just, it starts with a, a calf meandering through the woods and then followed by a dog and then the sheep and then a man because it's a little easier going down a beaten trail and then pretty soon everybody's winding along and they're paving this weaving road. And maybe that's what's happened to the church, is people are following a tradition of men and not the commandments of God. What does the Lord want us to do? Oh, but Lord, I might be different. Well, Jesus said, you follow me, you're going to be different. But how could all the churches be wrong? Well, that's what they said about the religious leaders in Christ's time. If he's the Messiah, why doesn't everyone else believe in him? If you're going to be a Bible Christian, you need to follow the Bible, follow the Word of God. So is Sunday sacred? No, it's just another working day. There's only one day in the Bible God is blessed. That's the seventh day Sabbath. Amen? You want to be a, a doer of the word and not just a hearer, friends. Amen?